welcome back to the latest edition of the Fantasy Alarm Fantasy Baseball Podcast. But of course, this is the off-season edition. First and foremost, little teaser for the episode today. We're going to be going over the state of the American League. But before that, we did cover the National League last week. Make sure you check that out at FantasyAlarm.com or wherever you get your podcast. But of course, with me as always, at The Salesman on Twitter. So Matt Sells, other than freezing where you are, how is uh, everything going for you? Not too bad. Uh, currently, I know the USPS and Amazon and whatever are all busy with the holidays. Hopefully, everybody's having lovely holidays, um, no matter what you celebrate. Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, Festivus, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, currently trying to sort out what exactly they're doing with some of my packages. Uh, and yes, I showed you video proof that my door, my front door is frozen uh, here in Lincoln, Nebraska. So it's, pre- it's pretty cold. Um, but you know what will warm me up? talking some baseball because we're like what three months from the start of spring training just about somewhere somewhere right around there yeah usually it's right around my birthday training games are february 25th i believe so we're like almost two months from spring training games yep i mean i'd love to make like a little uh free agency joke that everyone's probably heard before maybe the I don't even know if we can call it the hot stove anymore because a lot of the big name players have signed. And I think at this point, any signings are more of like the the lukewarm stove, maybe because it's fine, guys. A couple ones that are interesting left, but, you know, there's yeah, the no more boil? judges. Is it, is it a parboil stove? Is that what we're? Doing? Yeah, it's not quite hot, but it's a little more than room temp. You know, it's not quite room temp, but a couple signings um, we have to touch on last week because, of course, Murphy's Law has it is once you record about something, things must happen afterwards. So a couple quick signings just to touch on from the National League. So once again, make sure you check out the full state of the National League podcast that Matt and I did last week. Check that out wherever you get your podcast or fantasyalarm.com. But arguably the biggest one, Dansby Swanson heads to the Cubs. Saw some tweets. Sounds like the Cubs were his kind of top spot all along if it wasn't almost going to be Atlanta, just from what I've seen with some stuff. But we talked about the Cubs lineup and it needed another – I want to say impact back because Swanson definitely can be that, as we've seen in Atlanta. They needed help. And at the very least, you know, if Windy City, the winds are blowing right, you got to like that for Swanson's power production. But at the very least, other bats in that Chicago lineup, you almost have to feel a little bit better about heading into the season because there's at least a little bit more help in that lineup now. There is a little bit more help in that lineup. I was talking to a neighbor of mine who's a huge Cubs fan, and um, he said he wanted – Swanson over Correa anyway, um, which obviously savings wise, sure. But in terms of player, I think Swanson's game actually projects better long term than Correa's does um, just in terms of the type of player he is. I think he can stick it short longer than Correa can. Um, So, yeah, I like that. I like that signing for the Cubs. They needed some help somewhere. Look, they're still not going to be competitive for that division this year, even if everything goes right. Um, but it is getting the key <clears throat> signings in place now before some of their uh, pretty good prospects. They do have a pretty good farm system in terms of bats coming up. So, you know, th- this is setting the stage for that. But I still think they're a third or fourth place team in the Central this year. Maybe closer to third now with the, with the signing of, of um, Swanson, but I, they're still behind the Cardinals and Brewers. Yeah, when you look at Swanson too, I in the tra- in the MLB free agent tracker that we have, pretty much breaking down all the notable signings that happened. Matt and I split that. When you look at Swanson, some interesting things. He makes a ton of hard contact. I wasn't sure how much I was privy to the fact of how much hard contact he made. Like it is pretty impressive. And then the other thing you could say too, he's only a two forty six career hitter on the road compared to, um, you know, when you look at his home numbers, but. To his credit, for his career, he has hit 307 in Wrigley Field. Small sample size, worth worth noting nonetheless. But I was so yeah, surprised at how I, much hard hot contact that guy makes. I don't know how much I'd take the you can't. the the home road splits um, when people leave their, you know, because we all saw, oh, Nolan Arenado sucks on the road. Well, he was almost the MVP of the National League last year, and he's not at court. Um I think the problem with taking those numbers um, for anything other than a talking point is that guys get out of routine when they're on the road, right? Mm-hmm. They're not sleeping in their own bed. They're eating 
you know, still they these guys still get pretty good food unless you're in the minor leagues. Um, on the road, right? They get their stipend for going and getting food, and they, but it's not home cooked. It's not some of these guys have some chefs or some pre-made food or whatever. They get in their routine, seeing the family, all that good stuff. So now that you're switching to what your home park is, I, I don't, I don't take the 246. I mean, he's not going to be a 246 hitter. He he just he just won't. <clears throat> No, and it's it's one of those things too where it's not necessarily it's a talking point. That's essentially what it is. It allows right. you to put an extra sentence or two in a write up and go from there. But it it's more predicated on like the the offensive game. So if Arenado with a guy, go back to Arenado for example, you know, he hit 30, 40 home runs pretty much perennially. But if he was boosted on the back of course field and he had a sixty five percent ground ball rate, you know, that offensive game isn't going to shift away. Swanson's offensive game will play in any park. He's going right. to be fine. So and that's when it comes back to the whole hard contact that he makes. So I like it for the Cubs. I really like it for Seiya Suzuki and other guys in that lineup as well. Sure. So just something to note there with the Cubs. We head out to the West to the Dodgers. J.D. Martinez and Noah Syndergaard head to the Dodgers. Reports on Twitter that J.D. Martinez took less money to go to the Dodgers. I didn't quite look into it. just saw the tweet about it. But interesting, the Dodgers are kind of stacking up on – veterans there quick thoughts from me before i jump over to you jd martinez still a professional hitter he's going to be fine good lineup around him good park hard to hate that and noah Syndergaard, i think what we saw last year is what he's going to be can he get maybe more electrifying on the mount maybe but i think the the early Syndergaard days are done he is now a i'm going to look to go seven innings if i strike out three or four guys i'll be happy but I'm going for quality starts and I'm not exactly going to be a guy that lights up the radar gun anymore. That's just not his game. Yep. I agree. It turns out that if you have a human being try to throw a hundred miles an hour at max effort for every pitch, you're, you break down. So it turns out if you only throw like 80% effort and you can still hit 95, that's pretty effective, right? That's what we saw him do last year. He wants to stay healthy at this point and get, um, innings under his belt. So I think there's a little bit more strikeout game to come than what we saw last year. Um, but yeah, in, in general, he's going more for quality starts. Um, and the Dodgers have been whizzes with pitching mm-hmm. of, of late. He even he's, said that. It, he even said that. Yeah. We saw what they did with Tyler Anderson last year, turned that guy into just, you had to play him every time he pitched. It was unbelievable. Um, so yeah, I think he's I think he's relevant for fantasy. I don't think he's going to be dominating, but I think he's relevant. And JD Martinez, he's a professional hitter, like Freddie Freeman, basically, right? Like these guys are going to take pitches, they're going to swing at stuff that they can hit, they're going to hit for decent average. Freeman's probably got more pop at this point in his career, but you're going to get a pretty good batting average, and you're going to get. I don't know. J.D. Martinez could probably still be worth 25, maybe 30 homers. Yep. Yep. I I agree with you there. And one quick one. I want to get to jump jump into the American League, talk about the AL East. But one thing I do want to read, I want one word. Just one word. One word reaction to what I'm about to read you. So Matt Carpenter agreed to a one-year deal with the Padres. There's a player option for 2024. Per Ken Rosenthal, Carpenter's guaranteed $12 million and could earn a maximum of $21 million over two years if he, again, exercises player option, hits all of his escalators, hits every single incentive. So Matt Carpenter, the reclamation project that we worked to swing, went to the Yankees, played well, could get 21 mil over the next two years from the Padres. One word reaction. One word? Mine was whoa. Yeah. I would I go no to my advice to Coach <laughs> there is keep the stash. Yes. Clearly the stash is working for the power and the, and the money. So um, keep, keep the stash there. I don't know. I think he'll probably be platooned in whatever configuration yep. the Padres decide to use him. Yep. Um, I can't imagine he would play the field at this point. He's got to be like a DH candidate, right? Has to be. Um, I don't know. Would you take a late round flyer on him? Yeah, as long as my, as long as the league has daily moves, you'd have yeah. to do it that way. Yes, if you have yeah. weekly moves, you can't touch Matt Carpenter because he's only going to play like half the games a week. Yep. 
And if, and even if, if even if they have a week where they're going to face seven righties, come the sixth inning when they bring in a lefty, the Carpenter's getting yanked. So just not worth it. Not worth it there. But let's get to the American League. And let's start with the American League East because that's the one that's got a lot of headlines, the one we got to talk about. So the Yankees, the way I kind of look at the Yankees offseason is for the most part, they did what they needed to do. So they brought back Rizzo, which was great for Rizzo's fantasy value. It's, it's going to be at its peak in Yankee Stadium. So that is good. They brought back Aaron Judge, saved the fan base, and brought in Carlos Rodon, another ace that they needed. Six years, $162 million. If he stays healthy, could be a nice, I hate to say bargain because it's a lot of money, but a nice deal overall for a very talented left or left-hander. The only thing I don't agree with that the Yankees have done this offseason so far that I completely disagree with that you can't really sell me on is inking the general manager to another couple years. That is the biggest head scratcher, I think, from the Aussies. Pay Judge, blank check, fine. 162 mil for Rodon. Bring back Anthony Rizzo, cool. Resign Cashman for four more years, basically because he hasn't had a losing season, I think is what I saw. I don't know about that one. Yeah, um, we all know how vocal I've been about Brian Cashman. I've been calling for a couple of years now for Cashman to be fired. I'm sorry, winning seasons don't count for anything in New York. It's yep. World Series or bust and to you know I, I don't really count the late 90s world series as his even though he was gm because it was um you know his predecessor stick uh who put together those rosters um so i don't really count the three in the late 90s as his i'll give him credit for you know the 2001 and then the 2009 but still he's been gm since 96 and he's got basically two titles he can account for that's not that's not enough in nearly 30 years at the helm of the uh well what's previously been the richest organization in baseball now the team down the way in queens is um but yeah my so i agree with you on judge although the back end of that contract is going to suck because anybody yes. that's six foot seven is going to go downhill faster than Everybody else we've talked about, I think we talked about on the podcast before that of big hitters. So guys that are six, six or above after the age of 30, uh, counting their offensive war. So this doesn't include anything but base running and what they do with a bat in their hand. Adam Wainwright is the fifth highest war <laughs> bat in baseball history of anybody that's six, six or above after the age of 30. That's not great. We're not talking about what he's done on a mound for the last 10 years. We're just talking about what he did in the in the batter's box, right? And that includes when he tore his Achilles running to first base, right? Um, so that's not great that you can't find at least five active baseball players with a war better than, like, two. Mm -hmm. uh, so, look, if he brings our, – our colleague James Grande said if he brings a ring – He'll eat the back half of the contract. Okay. Fine, I guess. Um, the Carlos Rodon signing, I think, 27 mil a year for basically a co-ace is perfectly fine in my book. Mm -hmm. So the fact that even with all of the moves that the Mets made, there's a tweet I saw that put the Mets and the Yankees rotations up against each other, and almost everybody said they would take the Yankees rotation over the Mets, which are anchored by Scherzer and Verlander. Right? So I don't know if I'm willing to go quite that far. I think some stuff has to go right for the Yankees. Um, but it's certainly a lot deeper than it was like three weeks ago. So, um, and there's there's some concern in the write-up that I did about Carlos Rodon, um, both the separate write-up and in the tracker. There's, you know, there's been some people that have been concerned about basically a two-and-a-half pitch pitcher lasting in Yankee Stadium, and I comped them to... Kevin Gosman, who went from the Giants to the Blue Jays mm -hmm. uh, last year and is basically a two-and-a-half pitch pitcher. Uh, and he did fine. Like, his his ERA was mid-threes, right? Not great. But if you look at FIP, XFIP, Sierra, whatever else you want to look at, they were all sub-three. Okay, that's fine. He had lower home run per nine than in either of the two years in San Francisco. Um, so I think Rodon will be fine. Park factors, I think he's actually better in the AL East than he is in the NL West. Um, 
No, I like that signing. But I agree with you. Cashman needs needs to go. And if you're unsure of Cashman, tie him to Boone. Boone's contract expires at the end of 2024. Have Cashman's expire then, and you can make a decision on both the manager and the GM at the same time. Why you're giving the GM a four-year deal? It's not like a a, a college football coach where you can't convince a guy to come to a team because the GM might leave in a year. Like once a guy is signed and paid, who cares who's running the league, uh, running the team? So, yeah, that was a bad move by the Yankees. And when you look at it with Rodon, I, I talked about it too in like the tracker and stuff is he's fastball slider. That's what he yep. is. He'll mix in another pitch here and there. But both of those pitches are so darn good. And here's the thing. The, right. These two sentences, like they both can be true. Rodon can experience a slight home run bump in 2023 pitching at Yankee Stadium. Yes. It's also very possible that over the last two years, his home run per nine is 0.7. That can go up to 0.8 or 0.9 and still be fine. Like that's not even a that's not even a worry. He was he was above one each year from 2016 to 2020, and he still can be the high strikeout guy. And he's really honed things in. I'm I'm not worried. Rodon's still going to be he's going to be a, a co ace in reality. He's going to be an ace in fantasy formats in 2023 because he's so elite on a per inning basis. I just I don't I don't see. The, the, the only issue I see with Rodon, and it's not it's not a necessarily a knock on him, but, but from the early years and just like pretty much any pitcher in the game, home runs aren't going to break this contract. It's going to be if he can't stay healthy. That's the only way. If he lets up some home runs and pitches to a 3-5 ERA and strikes out over a batter per inning and the Yankees are winning games, that doesn't matter. If he's hurt and not out there, that's when this whole $162 million deal is going to go down the drain. This is all health dependent. That's all this is. Agreed. And also, those of you concerned about, oh, well, Yankee Stadium is a small park. Well, uh, San Francisco is better for right-handed hitters than Yankee Stadium is. Um, and so pitching from the left side, lefties are basically have no shot. The short porch in Yankee Stadium in right field doesn't come into play with a lefty on the mound. And if you're concerned about the other parks, well, Baltimore has the deepest left field in baseball now. So righties have trouble hitting homers. Toronto can be hit and miss. Tampa is not a very good hitter's park, uh, to be perfectly honest. And Fenway has a 37-foot wall in left field. So, like, you know, I think he's in a pretty good spot. He'll be just fine. And if you're worried about lefties against Rodon, you shouldn't be. No. Just go look at the numbers. Good luck. He's unhittable. He is. And it's his, his arsenal. Sure. He's only two pitches two and a half pitches, as you want to say, but that fastball works against both. And if you're a right-handed hitter, he's going to backflip that slider to death and put you away. And if you're a lefty, he is going to make you look like, I believe it's, was it John Cruck in the all-star game against Randy Johnson just flailed up there because he didn't want to be there? Well, yeah, but Randy also threw a fastball behind Cruck. <laughs> the first hit. That's true. Cruck <laughs> really wanted nothing to do with Randy Johnson. There could be some swings reminiscent of that. Lefties yes. against Rodon. That's how it comes. I mean, Pitchfield loves to. Rodon. Like, I put an entire clip of his in the write-up, um, and it's just it's just gross. Yeah. Let's go, to, let's go to Toronto. Let's take a look at them before we talk about maybe the most polarizing team in the division. But Toronto, it comes down to this. Kevin Kiermaier, one-year deal. Great defensive outfielder. See what it does with the bat. Chris Bassett, very good for that rotation. He's a new arm coming to... Uh, the American League East, who was with Oakland prior to the the Mets. So really, when we look at the Blue Jays, this team is anchored by the bats. They got a couple good arms there. Hopefully that they can continue to go. Does Toronto have enough horsepower or have they gotten better enough with really only signings of Bassett and Kiermaier here this offseason? Um, Not to mention some of the departures. Yeah, the Teoscar Hernandez one was interesting to me. Um Trading him out, that is, um, and replacing him with Kiermaier, who is great when he's on the field, but it's when he's on the field, right? The guy hasn't stayed healthy in a very long time. And if you're going, well, Tampa's outfield is AstroTurf, well, so is Toronto's. Um, So that doesn't really help him in the way he plays. It does get George Springer out of center field, so that may help Springer a bit. Um, I don't know. They've got a pretty good rotation, though. Mm Mm-hmm. When you when you look at it, putting Bassett in there is probably their third starter, um, maybe fourth. 
because they got Manoa, Gosman, Barrios, Bassett, and Kikuchi. And then, by the way, Ryu uh, may be healthy enough to come back in the second half. He's coming back from Tommy John from June of last year. So he could be an August, September guy. And then you got to figure out what you're doing with the rest of them. And that bullpen's pretty good. Um, you know, there are some pieces out there available still that they could make some moves. Um, and, you know, so right now I think this offense is pretty decent. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of pop there between Bichette, Guerrero, Kirk, and Chapman. Um, they do have three catchers, so they could deal a, a premium catcher for some help at some point because they have Kirk Jansen, and then they have a guy named Gabriel Moreno, who's one of the top catching prospects in baseball coming up. Um, so, yeah, I think, look, they were going, they were picked to go toe-to-toe with the Yankees last year. They basically did. Um, and I think they can do that again this year. I don't see any massive hole in this lineup. I mean, if Kiermeyer gets injured, okay, but you've still got a guy like Kevin Biggio on the bench and Santiago Espinal, who was decent um, on the bench. And, you know, they can make some moves. So it, it's it's pretty – look, their starting pitching staff might be the best in the American League. Yes, and the thing is, they might not have the star power of a Cole Rodon top, but – you can make a case five deep if you're taking it from one to five. Toronto's rotation is very, very good. Like, I mean, right now in the American League, I would put Toronto, Houston, and probably the Yankees as the top three rotations. And probably have to put New York, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't tell you who right now I would put definitively number one. Maybe the Yankees for Cole and Rodon, but I mean, Manoa was outstanding last year. Yes, so. very, very much so. Okay. We have to talk about him. Yes. Because it's very interesting. Yes. The Boston Red Sox. Justin Turner. Okay. Whatever. Kenley Jansen. Very. The bullpen was arguably the team's best. One of their top strengths. So it seems like a luxury to get Jansen, depending on like the other, lo- how you look at their lineup. Uh, paid a good bit for Masataka Yoshida. One could argue that the that was uh, the Mets guy uh, Senga was probably worth the contract that Yoshida got. But yeah, they should have know, flipped for sure. To each their own. And then the Red Sox. Now there's all this stuff coming. This is I'm cheating a little bit here because it's not exactly in this free agent class. I don't know if they're going to resign Devers. I don't know if they will either. I saw that report too. And Did you see the Galaxies Apart quote. Yeah, the that, last that time is, that's not a mincing of words. No, that the was last time I heard that about a player. Planted. Yeah, the last time I heard that about a player for them was Bogarts and he left. Um, yeah, this is gonna be like right now, and I don't remember. I haven't checked since the Justin Turner signing, but I can't imagine it's changed. They are 18th in payroll for this year. 18th, Boston. Everybody's. Oh, they always go toe-to-toe with the Yankees. They are 18th in payroll. You know who's ahead of them? Detroit. <laughs> Detroit, I'm pretty sure, is like $7 million ahead of Boston in payroll. Or within $7 million either way, right? Uh, Seattle's ahead of them. Like, come on. Like, what are you doing? Like, also, by the way, why are you signing Justin Turner? What position is Justin Turner going to play that you... It- it seems like, yeah, it sounds like he's going to be the DH, and then he is first base insurance for Tristan Casas. Yeah. I mean, okay, because you got Devers. But, like, here's the thing. You didn't sign Justin Turner for, like, a two-year deal so that you could then say, oh, we have a third baseman in case Devers leaves. Like, this is just a weird – their lineup right now is Masataki – this is from um, Roster Resource. Uh, Yoshida leading off, which – Probably happens, although he may be a number two hitter. Um, Trevor Story, Devers, Justin Turner, Verdugo, Kike Hernandez, Casas, Christian Arroyo, and Reese McGuire. Yep. And the bench is Connor Wong, who, great. You got him from the Dodgers for Mookie Betts. Great. He's like one of the only good pieces. That, well, unproven, really. We can't even say good because. He's unproven, and they let the other guy go, Jeter Downs. 
Uh, Dahlbeck <laughs> didn't hit a barn standing next to it. Um, Rob Refsnyder is somehow still in baseball and yet only 32 years old, which is shocking to me. Um, and we haven't even touched on the, the starting rotations. Not great either. You don't you don't like a rotation led by Chris Sale for all 87 innings that we'll probably get. I mean, yeah, and then you got Pavetta as a number two, and who knows if Garrett Whitlock's going to stay in the rotation full year because they can't seem to figure out what they're doing with him between the pen and the rotation. Uh, and by the way, he was a key part of why the pen was good enough last year because he was fantastic. But like, is he going to stay in the rotation or go to the pen? Paxton, okay, cool. And That's seventy innings, that'll be fun. Brian Bella, like, where's the rest of the? I don't know. And I'm not just trying to crap on him because I'm a Yankees fan and whatever. But like, this is like, our Boston sports fans on the staff will tell you it's been like John and Pempo is ready to jump out a window with the Red Sox. Like, it's not, I have no idea what they're doing. To me, as I look at this, and I don't expect this to be a hot take at all when you look at that the Red Sox finished last in the division I think last they, year. I think they do it again. And it might, the, the, the gap might be more than last year, if we're being honest. Yeah, because Baltimore's got guys that are coming up. They get a full year of Adley Rutschman. They get, they have... Some improvement in pitching. John Means should be back at some point. We should see Grayson. We should see Grayson Rodriguez, who would have come up last year. He's not gotten injured. D.L. Hall should be better, right? So, like, they've got guys coming, and they've made some decent— I mean, Adam Frazier, we'll talk about this, but Adam mm-hmm. Frazier's a pretty decent signing at second base. So, like, they got better. And Tampa gets Tyler Glass now back. Yep. Like— their offense is pretty good to begin with, right? And then they've got depth for days because they can call up whoever the heck they want to from the minor leagues. And then their rotation, Zach Eflin was signed to be their fourth starter. Because they have McClanahan, who could have won the Cy Young. Uh, Glass now, Rasmussen, Eflin, and Springs. That's a far better rotation. Well, when you look at when you look at the other teams in the AL East, like look at the fourth and fifth starters for each team. So, you know, we look at Toronto. Bassett would probably be what? The two in Boston? Yes. Okay. So then we'll go to that's Blue Jays. If we go to the Orioles, I mean, it just depends who you put in four. Let's just say for the sake of this, Grayson Rodriguez, he's probably there at worst three. Probably. We haven't, and we've hardly seen him. Right. And then you look but at the Rays. A, I mean, he's one of the best, if not the best pitching prospect in baseball. Exactly. Then the Rays, say Springs, he's probably at worst Boston's three. Right. At worst. And then you go to the Yankees. Uh, it doesn't matter whatever arm you take out of the back end of their part. At worst, at, basically every I mean, team right now it's Nestor is at Cortez. worst of three in Boston. Yeah, Right now it's Nestor Cortez who you can make an argument would be a number two in Boston. Yep. That tells you. and And then it's not even that we can say – when you definitively look at Boston's offense, I'm taking Toronto over them. I'm taking the Yankees over them. I'm so high on so many of these Orioles youngsters and even take, the Rays. Yeah. At worst, they're even. At worst, there is nothing. I don't think there's anything that the Boston has the best of in this division. And they don't even have the best budget saving mentality because that's that Tampa Bay's. Well, be okay. There. I will give them the best third baseman in the division. Okay. That, I mean, yeah. that's a little niche. Okay. I'm saying overall. Yeah, but I mean, I would take Devers. I mean, yeah, okay, but a year from now, we're probably talking about Devers signing somewhere else, and he's the highlight of our podcast that episode that week. Yeah, I mean, Boston won seventy eight games last year. Do they finish under that this year? Because yeah. I think so. I do too. That they, I mean, you they can't were take Bogarts and J D Martinez out of this lineup and replace them with Justin Turner and like Yoshida. Who's going to need some adjustment? There's going to be some time to adjust, so that it's, it might be a slower start for him. But you look, Boston was five games behind Baltimore for fourth in the AL East last year. I think that gap is widened, and yeah, it might not even be Baltimore for fourth. The, the Orioles traded a starter and their closer. Yep. At the deadline, and their first baseman Trey Mancini, who was like the heart of their team, right? They traded three key pieces at the deadline and still finished above 500, and were in the wild card running. Until maybe the last week of the season. Yep. Yep. Boston is Boston is clear fifth. I don't want to take too much time 
much more time with the American League's, League East, but I do want to touch on one thing. I talked about it in the free agent tracker, so go check it out. But Adam Frazier is a hell of a signing for Baltimore. He's yeah. a quote-unquote veteran bat. He can play what feels like five different positions. And he, at the very least, if some of those youngsters have a, like, maybe like a, a slower ramp up to the year or they're just trying to maintain some parts of that lineup, they can stick Frazier in a bunch of different spots. He'll help turn the lineup over at the bottom of the order. I think that's one of the better signings in this whole division, even though it's one nineteenth of the star power of some of the other names that we've seen inked deals in this division. Agreed. Like he didn't have the greatest year in Seattle last year, but that is also one of the hardest hitter parks in baseball. It's like the one of the lowest Babbitt parks in all of the league. Um, typically speaking, he's a pretty high um, average guy. He'll steal you double digit bags. He's a professional guy. He's not going to get beat all that often on things that he shouldn't get beat on. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great sneaky signing. He's, he may not be hugely fantasy relevant, but in reality, that's a great signing. Yep. Absolutely. Help. And like I said, help turn the lineup over. We'll come back finished up with the AL East at the end with the final question with them, but head over to the AL West Astros. They lost Justin Verlander. That's that. I mean, that stinks, but if there's any team that could probably withstand to lose their definitive ACE and still have a top through two or three rotation, in the American league, Houston was the only one that was going to be able to do that. So they yep. are going to be just fine there. And one could argue that their lineup heading into 2023 oh, better. just might be better. It's definitively better. Like, Jose Abreu is a huge upgrade over Yuli Gurriel. Yes. Like, Gurriel was great, but he was starting to age, and you could see it. Jose Abreu is three years removed from being the AL MVP. And the, the thing that gets me— By the look, way, he's coming off of a season where he hit 304. And you look at roster resource, the projected starting lineup versus right-handed pitching. Kyle Tucker and Jeremy Pena are right now their sixth and seventh hitter. Yeah. Now, I don't know if it'll actually be like that, but— just to say that, you're starting off with the top seven of Altuve, Brantley, Bregman, Alvarez, Abreu, Tucker, Pena. Good freaking luck. And then Chaz McCormick's not terrible. He's a clutch mm-hmm. dude. Uh, Martin Maldonado, okay, it's a catcher, right? Like, w- w- what are we expecting from them? But their rotation is Framber Valdez, Christian Javier, Lance McCullers, Luis Garcia, and Jose Urquidy is their fifth starter. Not one of those guys had an ERA higher than 3.95 last year. Yep. And all of them, except for McCuller, started at least 25 games. So it's not like they're small sample sizes, right? Like McCullers was 227 and eight starts. Okay, but he was coming off of injury. The other guys, Valdez, 282 and 31 games. Javier, 2.54 and 25 games. Luis Garcia, 372 and 28 games. And your fifth starter is Jose Urquidy at 394 and 28 games. Yep. That's, that's just ludicrous and the and by the way they got three dudes in triple a that could all come up and start in hunter brown forrest whitley and sean sean dubin yep that i was going to point out and, and brown looked darn good last year and oh my whitley. god brown is probably <laughs> the guy i fell in love with the most last year in yep. terms of like next ace caliber guy he's he's that yep he can be, and then also too their bullpen is still good like yes I don't know. I, I mean, to find a hole with this team, you're gonna have you're 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 poking, you're grasping at straws. Maybe like, catcher. Yeah, sure. And yeah. they've been pretty adamant that they're out looking and stuff. for everybody. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. And would they, the way, if they've Corey got Wilson, sure, is, that would have been cool. I mean, Corey Lee is going to be a great power bat when he figures out how to make contact. <laughs> it's a big. That's a big win, but agreed. Yeah. And, but and the nice thing is too, they they have that ability to wait for that. Uh huh. Like, it's cool. ridiculous. Yep. This team, this team is is loaded, and they're going to be good. They, I mean, they lost Verlander, added Abreu, you know, brought back Michael Brantley. Other than other than getting Abreu, a lot of it was kind of maintain what we have, go out and get guys. I mean, they have to be. They're. I mean, I and would they say they're. Signed- I guess the only questionable thing was why did Rafael Montero get a three-year deal? That seemed a little steep. But, yeah, but... You know, they got the money, so may as well use it. Lock up dudes who you love. Um, they're not going to have to pay Jeremy Pena very much money for the next, like, six years. So yeah. they're, <laughs> they're fine there. Altuve's there long-term. Abreu's on a three-year deal now. 
Bregman, I think, is the next guy up for a big deal, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and by the way, if Corey Lee can't figure it out, they have Yalner Diaz in AAA, who he's a pretty good up-and-coming catcher, first base outfield prospect guy, too. Yep. So Astros are good. Enough said about them. Yep. Mariners haven't been active in terms of signing people, but they're trading for what feels like everybody. So amidst all the deals, Colton Wong, Cooper Hummel, Teoscar Hernandez, led by you know their pitching staff, they didn't bring anybody in, but Castillo, Gilbert, Ray, and George Kirby is a hell of a top four as well. With all the moves that the Mariners made, are they better than last year's team, do you think? If Teoscar Hernandez has a better year than he did in Toronto, then yes. I don't think it's enough to overtake the Astros. Agreed. I don't think that they're like, it's a very good team, but Houston has given us no reason to doubt what they can do. Obviously they are the defending world series champs. They've been to six straight ALCSs. That's the only team ever in the history of baseball to do that. Um, it just seems like um, they need another, co- like Seattle needs another contact bat to me. They have an awful lot of pop, but not necessarily a whole heap ton of contact there. Um, And I think there's some lingering questions as to exactly what Jared Kalenic is going to be. Colton Wong had a heck of a season last year. See if he can keep it up. Um, Eugenio Suarez... Look, the guy's going to hit for a bazillion homers and then not make a lot of contact for base hits. So, overall, I think they are number two. I think they're second in this division. Um, That starting rotation is going to keep them in a lot of games. And the bullpen can just figure it out. So, that's my view on the, uh, the Mariners. Rangers have been a little quiet of late, but they came out with the, the big one of getting Jacob DeGrom in from the Met, so he immediately slots in one healthy as their number one pitcher. So you look at roster resources, it has DeGrom, Martin Perez, and John Gray as the top three. I don't know if they're just doing that to put a lefty in the mix there, but to me, John Gray is the two. I know Perez was solid last year, but I like John Gray as the two. Obviously, they found a lot of money in recent years when I got Semyon, Seager. I love, love, love. I don't know if it's low or – I think it's low, Nathaniel Lowe. I think he's the low, and the guy yeah. in Tampa Bay is the low. Um, yes, Brandon Lau and Nate Lowe. That's it. Yep. Nate and there's Lowe. Josh Lowe in Tampa that's still there, too. So, you know. And then, I mean, you got Adelise Garcia. The bottom of the lineup's a little bit concerning with Texas. I think they're going in for the splash moves. I have the questions I have with this here are more about not necessarily the players they brought in, but it's just, you know, can, based on the starting lineup, can a bottom third of Brad Miller, Leody Tavares, and Josh Smith turn over the lineup enough to get to your boys? And can DeGrom stay healthy? That's the big question. Yeah, I, I I think they're a year away, to be honest. Look, they made some other splashes with Andrew Heaney and Jacob DeRizzi in the starting rotation. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, uh, Andrew Heaney's got a heck of a curveball, but, like, nothing else. Um, Odorizzi was good for Atlanta, but it seems like everybody's good for Atlanta. So we'll see what happens there. Um I think this is about waiting it out for another year until some of their homegrown talent can come up, like Sam Huff, uh, their catching prospect, can come up. Um, They've got some other, you know, Justin uh, Foscue is a second base guy who's pretty close. Um, Luis Angel Acuna, which, by the way, is the brother of Ronald Acuna, um, He's in double A. He could be a quick mover this year because he really seemed to put it together last year. And then, you know, they've got some, you know, Bubba Thompson is a, is a guy that I would be looking to add right now in dynasties. Um, but they've got some starting pitching depth coming up too. So like you've got, um, you know, a couple of the guys they've drafted recently, like Cole Wynn, uh, Owen White still a little far down in double A. Jack Leiter is in triple A. They obviously just drafted um, Lighter's college teammate there. I'm blanking on uh, on his name. The guy the Mets drafted, and then oh, Kumar Rocker. Um, so they've got some 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 depth, but I think these signings are about hey, let's get a couple of key pieces in place, and then we'll turn the roster over next year when the prospects come. But I don't know. That's an awful lot of money to tread water. 
Yep, yep. I, I couldn't agree more there. Other team in the AL West. <laughs> there is another one after the Angels, but I don't know what all is to be said I mean, about they're that. AAA. Like, do we, like, I put in the notes for the show, do we really need to talk about them? Like, it's just embarrassing. So and when you look at really – yeah. And you look at the Angels, Trout, Otani, there you go. Taylor Ward's in there. Hopefully you get a healthy Rendon, Hunter Renfro, and Urshela at the bottom of the – or the bottom half of the lineup should be fine there. Otani, they, or Otani, they brought in Anderson, Patrick Sandoval. Okay, they're okay there. And the bullpen, they Carlos Estevez just might close for them if they don't go to some of the other guys they have there. I just, at this point, I'm just not sure if it's the Angels. They have all the talent. It just seems like there's like an, almost like an institutional curse that just does not allow this team to reach what it can be. I mean, you have two of the premier players of this uh, era, I guess you could say, with Trout and Otani, and you don't really have anything to show for it yet. So you, they just need health. It's going to come down to health. And I still don't think it's enough for them in this division. I don't think so either. I mean, I, I, I think it's a sneaky good lineup. One mm-hmm. through nine. I think it's actually a sneaky good lineup. I really like Logan Ohapi, who they got from the Phillies as their catching prospect last year in the deal that sent uh, Thor to the Phillies for the second half of the year. Um, but I'm with you. I don't know that it's enough to... Look, it may keep them third in this division, which gives them an outside shot at a playoff chance given the expanded um, playoffs now. But if Rendon doesn't stay healthy, I I don't know that they make the playoffs. Right? It seems like an awful lot to put on one guy, but Rendon at his best can be a 30 home run, 290 gold glove third baseman. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. We already know that Trout is battling some degenerative back thing, so he might move to left field at some point. Um, Otani, this is he's a free agent after this year. So they got to show him that they can actually compete. Otherwise, that guy's going to be gone for like a half a billion dollars um, after the season. So and I, I don't know that there's a whole lot coming from their their minor leagues right now. Like the Angels farm system, try as they might, they have not been great at developing homegrown talent. Like Joe Adele is still there in the minor leagues, but his taste of the majors did not really go all that well last year. Um, I mean, he's still just 24, so he's got he's got a shot, but. They need. I'm with you. They need guys to stay healthy, and then maybe they eke into a playoff spot because they're the third team in the AL West. But that's about the best you can hope for with the Angels this year. Yep, yep, I agree. And last team in there, Oakland, just go look at their lineup and you'll and see. And then what throw up. Yep, and we'll, you'll see why we're carrying on here. Head to the AL Central. Obviously, White Sox lose Jose Abreu, but Mike Clevenger, one-year deal, okay. Andrew Benintendi, five-year deal. The, the, the that's annual... Confusing. The what? That's confusing to me. Yeah, the That's annual crazy. amount isn't bad, but, I mean, he's just a guy. He's he's a it's corner a outfielder guy. that hits 275, maybe 15 homers, and, like, eight stolen bases. I mean, he plays okay. a very good defensive left field, but, like, I mean, I guess they're doing it so they get Aloy Jimenez out of the outfield and they just have him D8 so he doesn't go, like, rip his shoulder off on the outfield wall again. But... I don't know, man. Five years for a guy who, in the middle of a playoff run, couldn't stay healthy and then also couldn't make contact once the Yankees got him. Like, he he could not make contact. It was um, – so, I don't, I don't know. Do they have enough bats to win this division? Probably. Probably. If Tim Anderson, Luis uh, Robert, Aloy Jimenez, Yoan Moncada, Andrew Vaughn, Yosemite Grandal, Gavin Sheets – I'll do what they're supposed to do. I think they have enough bats. Will that happen? I don't know. And there's enough talent in the rotation. I mean, Dylan Cease is a, is a yeah. stud. Maybe Lynn or Giolito are fine. Clevenger can be okay, healthy. And Kopech obviously has, has an immense amount of potential. I think one thing we'll have to see with the White Sox is there's a lot of teams poking around Liam Hendricks right now. So yeah. have to I see if they deal if him. June, I would – I mean, if they're off to a bad start, I would assume that they would deal – Hendricks at that point. So you don't expect him to get dealt before the season? No. Okay. I think they have every idea that they will compete with. Look, 
they they were leading the division for like half the year last year, and then they mm-hmm. fell off late. And they don't have Tony Larusa in the in the dugout, which is actually addition by subtraction because that guy can't manage for crap. Um, he should just go back to drinking and trying not to drive. Um, like <sighs> he he was terrible. He intentionally walked Trey Turner in a one two count like twice. Like who does that? Um. So I think they have enough to finish ahead of the Twins, Tigers, and Royals. The Guardians seem to be on some sort of magical run last year, but I think they have enough to win. But if they're at, if 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 if, it, if they don't get off to a great start, I could see Liam Hendricks being a trade piece halfway through the year. Yep, yep. I well, see, there's teams poking around them now. If they're doing it now and they don't deal them now, come because here's the other thing: like they have Garrett Crochet coming back at some point right he had tommy john last april so he should be back fairly soon but other than that there's not really any prospects to speak of that are that close at this point um like oscar colas is getting a lot of attention but he's still probably a year away i would imagine um yolekwe cespedes Again, getting some attention, but he's probably a year away. Hey, you want to know who's playing outfield in AAA with those two dudes? Who? A guy named Billy Hamilton. Yep. The actual Billy Hamilton. The fast one. Yes, the 32 year. He somehow he's still only 32, which I I think I think Fangraphs is lying to me on that one. Um, but yes, he they signed him to a minor league deal. Not that it matters, but just find it entertaining. Yep. So I think they finished second in the division. Am I crazy for loving what the Guardians have done this offseason, mainly with the no, Josh Bell and Mike great. Zanino signings? I think the Josh Bell, look, I wanted the Nats to sign Josh Bell back. Like, mm-hmm. I thought they could have gotten him for not that much money, and it turns out you could have because I don't think the Guardians spent all that much on Josh Bell. Mm-hmm. Um, two-year deal to sure up first base. Awesome, because they haven't been able to find a first baseman in, like, five years that's capable of playing first base. And Zanino's just there to keep Bo Naylor from having to play every day so they can bring him along at the pace they want to. I didn't think they needed all that much help. I mean, they won 92 games last year. Right? Like, that rotation's pretty good. So Pen's fine. Yeah. I, I don't have a problem with anything they did. And by the way, if you look at my prospect rankings, they have one of the best farm systems in baseball. Mm-hmm. So they got they got people ha- coming. But yeah, I, I I think they're I think they're perfectly fine. I think they win the division again. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't. Yep. I agree I agree there. I love what they did. I love Josh Bell. I love what he's going to do. Provides uh, protection for Jose Ramirez in that lineup, and just is going to keep things going on. Another and power way, to help. Two switch hitters back to back with Ramirez yep. and Bell, so you can't even game plan against them in late innings because they can just face off with the opposite hand. Yep, yep. Love what they did. Let's go to Minnesota. Gary Sanchez out, Christian Vasquez in, and Joey Gallo comes in on a one-year deal. I'm um, just kind of meh on these they're fine i like the vasquez one more than the gallo one but i get it you know low risk potentially high reward with gallo and just see I mean, if he can makes... return to form so here's my question how many thousands of dollars are they going to pay per strikeout for gallo because it's like an 11 million dollar deal right like a one year 11 probably, mil. probably a lot i mean the guy's gonna yeah uh I don't know. I don't even think it's like the shift that hurt him because he's not even making enough contact to hit it into the shift. Um, Christian Vasquez, that's an upgrade to me, a catcher. Yes. Um, Like you might lose pop, but you're going to gain contact and defensive awareness and ability. Yep. Um, Kyle Farmer is a backup middle infielder is nice. I like that move. Um, The biggest question for me is can their rotation stay healthy? If their rotation stays healthy, I think they can fight for anywhere between second and third, I mean, I, they might go toe to toe with the White Sox here for for second. Yep. But yeah, I. They're just meh. They're fine. They're whatever. They are what they are. To be honest. Yeah. And then pitching wise, I probably like their rotation the 
best amongst what they have on their team. Oh, no, I like their bullpen a little bit, too, mainly just because of Yohan Duran. But Sonny Gray, Joe Ryan, Tyler Molly, Ken Tomeda, and Bailey Ober is not a bad little rotation. No, it's not. But the question is, like, can they get everybody to stay healthy? Because you've got Tomeda missed all of last year, right? And then you've got, based on last year's numbers, the most starts made in that rotation was Joe Ryan at 27. Sonny Gray, 24, Molly, 23, and Bailey over at 11. Now, he was kind of up and down and injured and whatever. But they just need health out of that rotation, and I think they can be okay. And then lastly in the division, Tigers get Matthew Boyd and Michael Lorenzen okay. Royals get Ryan Yarbrough and Jordan Lyles okay. Um, I actually think the Royals – I actually like the Royals better than the Tigers this year. I think I would agree with you there. And the offense for the Royals is sneaky good. Correct. Right? Like, you've got MJ Melendez, Bobby Witt Jr., who, by the way, is, like, one of the only rookies ever to hit 2020. (laughs) Um, Salvi is back. Vinny Pasquantino. If Alberto Mondesi can stay healthy, there's some sneaky good bat in the middle of the order. Edward Olivares, I don't know about yet. Whatever, but I do like Drew Waters. Michael A has been pretty good for the Royals. Agreed. Nicky Lopez was underrated last year, I thought. So, um, and you've got a guy named Hunter Dozier on the bench who was at one point the starting third baseman that everybody loved. Mm-hmm. So, um, starting rotations bad. Well, okay. So there was a tweet I saw the other day that said like pitchers with higher than thirty percent CSW, which is called plus swinging strike rate, which is whatever. Like, a lot of people like the stat. I'm not the biggest fan of it because the umps right now suck, so you're getting credit for umps being terrible. Um, And then, so pitchers with higher than 30% CSW and lower than a 6% walk rate, Brady Singer was on that list. Yeah, I I like Singer. I, I saw him live. In My wife and I went to a game last summer. Uh, They were playing the Tigers, actually. Um, and Brady Singer started, and his stuff was pretty decent. I like now, granted, Detroit's offense was terrible, and Javier Baez, I think, struck out more than he made contact. Um, but he's got some sneaky good swing and miss stuff. I mean, he was a first round pick, right? He anchored the Florida Gators lineup that got like four guys drafted in the first round. Um, so you know. Look, it's okay. It's not full of star power. I do like the Ryan Yarborough signing a little bit uh, for them because I think he's he's sneaky interesting there. Um, so we'll see. But I do like – I mean, I'm not saying the Royals win the division by any means. I just think they beat the Tigers. Yeah. No, I, I agree there. So we'll go ahead. We're a little over time here, so we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode. But one last thing to leave you with. Looking at the division, quick overlook of all of them, or I should say the the whole American League. I'm probably going Yankees for the AL East. I'm 100% going Astros for the AL West. And then I like the Guardians in the Central. Do you agree or you got anything different? Um, no, I would, I would agree. What's your easiest one to predict? And what's, like, how are you ranking these in terms of easiest and hardest to predict finishing yeah. spots? I'm most confident about the Astros. I just I think they're far and away better than every team in that division. They're so they're just so good. So yeah, I, I'm the most confident about the Astros. After that, <sighs> I think I'm most confident in the order of the AL West. To be honest, yeah, I think I would pin it. I know the I'm most confident in the Astros. I'm confident with that division how it's going to shake out. And then after that, I mean, the Central and the East are just I I kind of know the groupings. Of the teams, right? I can put. I just don't know the order, like how they're gonna go. Like you know, in the AL Central, Guardians and White Sox are one. I'm I'm going with them as one two. So I like the Guardians to win it, White Sox two, and then from there, Twins are definitely three. Probably go Twins, Royals, Tigers. Correct, and that's that's probably what I would do. And then the AL East, like it's Yankees, Blue Jays one and two, and then Rays and O's, who's there, and then Boston's fifth. Like, for most of these divisions, I know one and five. It's just a matter of how two, three, and four shake out. And most of the time, it's really how two and three shake out. Yeah, for me, I think the AL East is most akin to my NL Central, where, like, 
we knew the Reds would be last. Well, not that we know, but like we're pretty confident the Reds are going to be last. The Red Sox are going to be last in the AL East. Uh, pretty sure the Blue Jays are second. Pretty sure the Yankees are first. After that, third and fourth, I would say it depends on who gets the most out of their younger guys. And right now I would lean towards Rays being third and O's being fourth, but I could totally see it flip if some guys don't stay healthy or they get or the O's get more out of their starting rotation than we think. Um that could flip, but I would I would say that there. AL West, I'm going Astros, Mariners. The A's are clearly last. They're terrible. They're horrifyingly bad. I would be shocked if they won more than 50 games. Um, but I, I have a hard time trying to figure out if it would be the Rangers or Angels in third place for me. Um, and the AL Central, it's the Guardians, the White Sox. Twins, Royals, Tigers. That's how yep. Yep. I think I would agree with you there. So while we continue to go through MLB free agency, check out fantasyalarm.com. We'll be updating the MLB free agent tracker as new signings roll in. So keep an eye for all the content there. And then um, obviously every fantasy baseball season, there's a particular publication, online publication seems to come out. So keep an eye out for any news coming about that in the coming days, weeks wherever it ends up being. But till then, check out all the great content at FantasyAlarm.com. I'm on Twitter at Colby R. Conway. Find Matt on Twitter at The Salesman. Give us both a follow. And I'm not sure when our next episode will be here, so keep an eye out on the, like I said, keep an eye out for the MLB Free Agent Trackers. That's where we're updating everything. And just keep an eye out for any new episodes that drop. So for this edition of the Fantasy Alarm Fantasy Baseball Podcast, I'm Colby Conway. That's Matt Sells, and we will see you next time.